doing that don't I <laughs> positive affirmations good evening good afternoon good morning and I always keep telling myself to always make sure that I turn my phones off um and so let me do that now okay how are you all doing out there in beautiful around the world whoever's picking up this interview today um I've got the wonderful Lexi Dubry um who is waiting in the wings and she's just had a day and a half, she said. So I had to make sure that she breathed um, and get herself composed before we actually came online. So before I actually start, as I said, always positive affirmations to all you gorgeous, wonderful people out there. And I'm doing all of this because every week I keep doing this with this flaming light. And I am going to throw it out the window way. But it was a beautiful day, beautiful sunshine. So I'm going to make sure, pretend I'm in the tropics um, because that's how I feel. I, I feel good. I feel really good. And I hope that all of you out there feel good too. Again, positive affirmations. Now, before my guest join me, people might be asking, mm, who is Lexi Dubry? Well, I can let her do that for herself. And as you know, on um, my show, Standing in My Truth, we have a wide variation of people from all walks of life, from all diversity, inclusivity. No one is exempt from Standing in My Truth. It's where people who have um, are unsung heroes, who are making changes out there in the universe that we probably would never have recognised, um, you know, if we don't see them on the BBC or Channel 4 or Sky. But there are people out there who are championing and doing the most amazing things out there. I hope everyone can hear me because I just realised I'm a bit far away from my microphone. So um, I'll check into the chat room very shortly to see how we're all doing. Lexi Dubry, who is Lexi? Good evening, Natasha, and to everybody else that's going to join us in the chat room today. I hope all is well. Um, again, who is Lexi Dubry? Lexi is gorgeous. I've, I, I, when I first spoke to her, I felt my spiritual side literally leapt out of the phone onto the pages of our emails um, just to meet this wonderful young lady. Lexi is an ex-footballer used to play for the Arsenal Ladies and Leighton Orient. Um, she's an FA coach. Uh, she's also a, an, a youth um, advocate and an ambassador for kick out, oh, kick out, kick off at three. But there's so many, and oh, did I tell you she's also an, a referee, football referee. Now, how many female football referees are we going to get? Now, I'm going to stop and bring in the wonderful young lady herself. She's had a journey and I want her story to be told. It's not all about sports. It's all about her. And without further ado, I'm going to bring in the beautiful Lexi Duvery. Hi. How are you? Blessings. Blessings back. How are you? Oh, my God. And you still got the audacity to wear the Arsenal top, yeah? I mean, oh, Rugsa, I had to come represent today. <laughs> oh, my God. She actually had to wear the Arsenal top. You know what? I think I'm about to just throw this off <laughs> on my top. No, <laughs> no that is just like a disgrace. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> Good evening, Lexi. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, as you said um, in the intro, it's been uh, a stressful day in a sense, but I've seen it through. God is good. And I'm here today and excited to converse with you. So, totally, totally. As I said to everybody else, I know you've had a bit of a day um, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this with some people. For your day started where you got up to go to work, you got a, you slammed your finger in the car door, you then end up getting a, <laughs> a parking ticket. You've had this, you, you know, I won't tell everybody that you, you know, what you do now. I let them mm. tell that, but i tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to go... <sighs> That's right, because now I'm going to kick back. 
I'm going to be make myself comfortable. And to everybody else out there, this is where you're going to sit back and listen to the wonderful Lexi's story. Lexi, please yourself, introduce yourself to the community out there and where you actually come from. Give us a brief synopsis. Okay. Um, Over to well, you. Good evening, all. Um, thank you for tuning in and letting me share my story. Thank you to Valerie, first and foremost, and Kickoff at Free for creating the link between us to share this night tonight. Um, where do I start? Uh, right, so I take it back to the beginning. Um, as Valerie said, um, I'm a retired youth professional footballer playing for the likes of Leighton Orient and Arsenal. Um, I started playing football at the age of about seven or eight, where um, my talent was actually identified by one of my uncles. Um, initially, I was in singing and dancing, but invited me to a game in which my cousin, who's the same age, was also playing in, and he invited me down. It was a boys oh, game. You were singing and dancing first? I mean... <laughs> Let's let's tell you what, we're going to park the football bit for a second. So <laughs> let, let, I'm going to guide you here because now you're now I'm like, whoa, OK, singing and dancing. So mm -hmm. you were singing and dancing from what age? Um, So my mum put me in singing and dancing. I think I was about six when I started. Okay. Um, I was doing tap, modern and jazz with a bit of street dance Um, and obviously the singing on top. But, um, oh my yeah, god, you can sing as well. Um, I can hold a melody now, I don't know really about the singing part, but <laughs> you can hold That's a melody, no, not even a note, but a melody, a melody, just the, the little, you know, the little, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, just make sure that voice of yours is going to be a bit silky because you, you may never know. I might even ask you to just do a hook or something. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so here you are you were doing a bit of tap dance modern is that where you want is that what you wanted to do or is that what a choice of your parent um I think at the time I was quite a energetic um child I used to play football with my cousins but back then we're talking probably well I'm 26 now so we're talking nearly 20 years ago um oh. and at that time women's football wasn't what it was so it was just getting me into something that would um, allow me to express myself. And my mum my and I, we wasn't aware of the female football teams or an avenue for young female footballers. So um, that's probably the reason why we more stemmed in the singing and dancing um, avenue. Okay. So here you are, you're thinking to yourself, well, this is what I'm going to do, you know, because um, as you said, football wasn't very prominent, especially for females. Um, but then you said that your uncle, you persevered. So you still did the singing, but you were still playing football. Is that correct? Yeah, so I did. Um, so I was in singing and dancing for probably a year or two, um, done a few shows and so forth. And then, as I said, my uncle invited me down to one of my cousin's games. Um, and then the singing and dancing pretty much went out the window from there. So, um, yeah, that was probably the, the finding of my football talent. But again, you know, you're, you keep saying your cousin and your uncle, your cousin and your uncle. You might as well just tell everybody who your bleeding cousin and your uncle is. <laughs> So, you know, just let's just stop them going, mm, okay, cousin, uncle, cousin, uncle. I know, I don't need to use that, but go on. Let's just tell everybody who he is. All right, so the cousin and uncle I'm talking about now, big up Uncle Tony and my cousin Dion A for the the um, first platform I got to perform. But what Valerie is getting onto is my cousin is Michael DeBerry, um, used to play for Chelsea and Leeds, so I put that Ooh. out there. Sorry, Michael, <laughs> I'm only booing Chelsea. The Leeds I can live with, but the Chelsea, um, do you know what I mean? Yes, yes. Michael Dubry, um, awesome, awesome footballer, you know. He knows like Paul Cannonville, et cetera, et cetera. But we won't go into that. So that's who your cousin is. And that's where your platform started and you were then picked up. Take away your story. Well, it, I, let me ask you this question as well. Where do, you, uh, where do your family originate from? Where are you born? Okay, so um, I grew up in East London. Um, um, I was born in Goodmays Hospital 
and reside in the like borderline East London Essex area currently in okay. Redbridge. Ilford, Ilford, yeah, Ilford, yeah. yeah. But my family grew up in North London, hence the you know the little. Asshole. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I've not eaten yet, so I don't want to start start feeling <laughs> sick. Sorry, I might start having a um, a bit of a headache. But okay, <laughs> yeah. So my family grew up in um, Islington area, um, hence the reason why we're very strong Arsenal supporters. <laughs> so about that, <laughs> and they just pop them down the road. So. Okay, we were sorry, folks. We won't keep going on about that. So that's <laughs> where you originate. So your platform. So you went in school. When you was at school, did they allow you to play football as a as a female? Was that something that was allowed? Um. So initially, um, at the time, again, women's football wasn't what it is today. So when I did play football, um, I represented the boys' teams. So I think when I was in primary school, I got selected for um, district which is um, your local borough. Um, however, in the latter years of um, primary school, I, w- I moved schools. So I was initially in Barking and I moved to Redbridge. And when I moved schools, the first thing I asked about was a football team. And um, that's, so I played, um, it was a mixed team and we featured in like, a, it's called a mini games whereby you play um, against other boroughs and so forth. And that's when I was scouted by Leighton Orient and it pretty much went from there. I have to say, Leighton Orient, no disrespect, is, and I did say this to, I had Kevin Lisby on um, a few weeks back and, you know, you know, you always find that no matter what team you support, you always have a second team. And mm. Leighton Orient, you know, me being an East End girl uh, is my second team. So they're one of the first teams at a bar when I don't look out for Tottenham that I look <laughs> out for next. Do you know what I mean? And it yeah. sounds like I keep going on about Spurs with this whole flipping. <laughs> You're just trying to get out there. You should have put your shirt on for a the Titans. I've a break and I come back, you know what I've got to do. No, <laughs> But so, yeah, okay. So there you are. And as you said, you played for a mixed team. Take me on the journey now from here on playing the mixed team. Um, So forgive me because I've got to go back a couple of years um, in the memory, in the memory log. But um, yeah, so I, as I said, I started with um, the match I played with my cousin. um, I won a corner. um, So I got brought on in the match at the later stages. Um, I won a corner and all the guys were like, yeah, I'm going to take it, I'm going to take it. I'm like, no, I'm taking it. I won it, I'm going to take it. And I actually managed to convert the corner into a goal. Like I scored from the corner and everyone just went, (laughs) I mean, (laughs) no, I'm taking it. (laughs) I'm really pleased. Um, Everyone went crazy from there. So my uncle like, was pushing my mum say, you know what? Your daughter's a baller, you know. You've got to get her into football. So after that, that's when I went to the mixed team and got scouted by Leighton Orient. And um, I used to train twice a week and play matches on a Saturday. Um, at that time, Leighton Orient, the youth women's youth team, or sorry, the female youth team, um, they competed with the likes of Arsenal, Chelsea, um, your top teams, we were like top of the, one of the top te- top clubs, sorry, um, for our age group um, at the time. Um, so I played for Leighton Orient for four years um, from the age of 11 to 15. And um, again, in the later stages, I was called up to play for the older team. So I used to captain the under 14s, but I was asked to play up for the under 16s. And okay. um in that game is where um, I, I suffered an injury. Um, I was taken out by one of the ladies I was playing against and um, it resulted in me fracturing my kneecap um, oh and God. having a floating bone in my knee um, and yeah, so forth. But I'll get on to the injury stuff a bit later. Um, so having recovered from my injury, which because of my age at the time, they said my body was still developing so um, I think it took me a couple of months to get back to it. And then the following year, um, I Leighton Orient actually went into administration. So, oh, you're joking. Yeah, it did. And we had a really good team at the time. We was doing a lot for the club and um, the 
the um the achievements we were getting as a team it was doing a lot for Leighton Orient and so forth especially but, yes, being female as well right definitely definitely and I think it sort of knocked us for six a bit um but I was able to get picked up by both Arsenal and Chelsea um they were both interested of which I secured a place at both at this time it was um like so college and football um, due to Chelsea being so far and the lack of academic um, selection that they offered, um, I went for the choice of Arsenal as well as, of course, being a Gunnar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I played for Arsenal about a year, year and a half. And um, I then went on to re-rupture my the, the oh, initial no. injury I had, um, which unfortunately led to me being released from the team as I was making the transition from the youth to the um, first team. So, yeah. Oh, so God. And so that literally, in. that stopped the career completely. Yeah. So, um, so getting on to my injury. So in the space of 18 months, um, I suffered uh, arterial ligament tear to both knees, um, initially my right, followed by my left. Um, as I said, I was at Arsenal at the time and because of how um, how good Arsenal women's team were, they had access to players from all over the country and in fact abroad as well. Um, so obviously not being able to play at my full capacity, um, I, didn't, I wasn't selected at the trial because I was playing with an injury and um, I was released from the club. Um, the only benefit that came out of it was the fact that um, one, the physio at Arsenal at the time, she was able to write to the NHS, which made, which granted my surgery, because I think if that hadn't have ta taken place, then I'd be in a much worse situation than I am in today. And that and she was able to, as you said, secure that, because if you didn't have that operation, what would have been the actual end the, the, the final decision what would you say that would have been um well they were reluctant to give me scans mri scans are five thousand pounds well worth five thousand pounds at the time per scan um i think i had three in total um by the end of um after everything and um i would have just been i would have had rock foot to be honest <laughs> <laughs> I would have just had a broke foot. It's, it's, a, it's a struggle as it is now. So boy, without that surgery, I don't know where I would have been. Thank God that I was. I had to get, somebody, yeah, was somebody would come yeah. out. So yeah, you had, the, so you had the, the the injury. You had the scan. The scan showed up. You needed the in the the operation. You have then had the operation. What was yeah. the rehabilitation like after? Um, so this is where um, things sort of deteriorated again. So when I had my initial surgery, I had a keyhole surgery to start with, but they weren't able to do what they needed to do. So um, I then went on to have full ligament reconstruction, um, which they had to repair the ACL. So I had my hamstring tendon um, to to be replaced a, a replacement for my ligament. So currently in both knees, I have my hamstring tendons as artificial ligaments. Um, sorry, it's it's so overwhelming it's, just trying okay. to remember what happened. Um, remember what I said to you, breathe. And only breathe. speak about what you feel calm with. Uh, as I said, yeah. this is really all about you. And um I'm, I, and I'm wincing, like I'm in pain, because, you know, but take your time and tell your story. Just take your time. Yeah, so um, the, when I initially ruptured my knee, as I said, I had a fractured kneecap, a floating bone in my knee, and um, I actually underwent three surgeries in one on both occasions. Um, the cartilage, the ACL, and the meniscus were all broken at the same time, were all ruptured at the same time. So um, with regards to the question you asked the rehab, um, I was released by Arsenal. So I had no support through the football avenues, professional football avenues. I was left to my own devices. Um, I was on crutches for about nine months in which I had to learn to walk again. Um, and then... 
with no one there was no when you say no support mm -hmm. um no one reached out from the club even though they let you go and I'm talking about you may have kept in touch with people from Leighton Orient or or Arsenal there was still that support was not there yeah, I think. And I'm not trying. Remember, I'm not trying to bow, bad mouth them. I just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, most definitely. As I said, standing my truth, and I'll forever keep it real. I think, like at the time, my mum supported me the whole way. When we, when I was playing for Arsenal, my mum was having to travel Southampton, Northampton, Luton, like offer off of her own petrol, no expenses whatsoever. And it's funny because one of the professional footballers today who plays for a Premier League side, he was under eight at Chelsea at the time. And where um, my mum went to the hairdressers at the time, the, his mum always used to speak of, yeah, um, he gets picked up, he gets expenses and all of these things, which as women, young women, we never received that. So um, with regards to the support, I had support from my family, but other to my family, we had no one. The, even the hospitals, after I they, I learned how to walk, I probably had about six to eight weeks rehab. And then that was it. Like, Lexi was gone. Despite everything I done, I did for Arsenal, the amount of potential and talent I had, it's like we were just numbers. And I think, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get on to later, um, a lot of the youth of today are considered as just numbers, hence the reason why when we get onto it, I do what I do. In a sense, right. of professionalism, what I professionalism, yeah, and so forth, yeah. But to, here you are learning to walk again, which and the pain, um, medication, you know, the the, the painkillers, because you could have easily got so addicted to all of that. Yeah, you know? I was. I can't remember the exact measurement, but I was on cocodamol, um, with ibuprofen, so that just goes to show how painful it was um I think I had about 13 stitches in my knee um not then, one but both right both so no the one knee so this the, what I'm talking about right now was just the initial injury the first leg so after I went through all of this no support nothing I came back managed to get myself back into football and then oh. within 18 months I did the other knee oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> I know I know <laughs> I know. <sighs> okay, I'm, I'm, and I'm breathing. I'm breathing. Remember to breathe. We're yeah, breathing. I'm, I'm, I'm breathing with you. I'm breathing with you. <laughs> Lexi, you had nine, ten months out, and you took, you went right back into football. And then, how long did it take before your second, your net, your your your, your second knee went? So it took. I think. So I had a. I had surgery in 2000, so because it's so long ago, all I remember is I had surgery in 2011 and I had surgery in 2013. So when I say 18 months, that was the from the initial injury, the recovery, and then the little gap, which was probably three to four months potentially um, after I did the other knee, um, after until I did the other knee, sorry. How bad was that injury? <sighs> Exactly the same, if not worse. I went for what exactly the, the same thing. Excuse my French. No worries, no worries. Yeah, exactly the same thing. Um, ruptured the ligament, the meniscus, the cartilage. Um, yeah, for those who don't know what the meniscus is, tell us. Well, I couldn't even tell you. are not trying to be stupid, <laughs> but... You know, your cartilage, um, everyone knows the cartilage. The meniscus yeah. is in the back of the kneecap, isn't it? Yeah. Get That's in, right. Val. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I just know. Listen, from when I got the injury, uh, it was just so hard. I think at the time as well, um, only now I'm starting to digest how much of an effect it had on me. I think at that time, you just see it, oh, I'm injured, I'll get over it. But then a lot of the girls that I used to play with, they're first team players today. So when I look back on things, it just shows how much of an avenue there was. And if things were dealt with in such a way, in a sense of the support from the club, the support from the NHS and so forth. Even the thing is, as well, I'm not even asking like, for direct support, but being a big club, put me in the direction for someone that's going to support me, refer me to someone, whether I have to pay or not, that's a different story in itself. But just the guidance, because as I said, my mum was my my only lead. 
I learned pretty much everything from my mom. My mom supported me. Other to that, we had no one. And for how much she done for me, for me to be able to do for the club, it was just like one minute we're there, next minute we're gone. Next minute gone. Just like that. So. So you've done the second knee. How long was that recovery? Um, so I think the second knee took me 13 months in total to recover. And to be honest, they're still not, even to today, they're still not fully recovered. I still, this is, so as I said, 2011, 2013, so eight and 10 years, and I'm still facing issues. Um, I've only just started rehab with my knees through um, a connection, um, big up, Jello promotions um again connected and we're going to come to that because we spoke about that so yes. let, let's let let's feed let's keep feeding everybody let's no keep problem. feeding them you've had this injury and good you know look even if I wince when I hit my ankle and you know I know how painful that is so I and I can only imagine I know that my mother's legs have gone, so I can only imagine. But you have gone one better to survive two dab life, you know, life threatening because you could not be walking, you could be stick, you know, with sticks right now, mm -hmm. two walking sticks. But you've come through that. But people don't understand what you've had to go through to get there. Mm. Yeah. Knowing that after those 13 months, you didn't go back to play football, did you? No. So, um, tell a lie, I did go back, but I couldn't compete at the same level. And my knees just couldn't bear the, like, it would take me four to five days recovery. My knees would swell up straight after. I couldn't play the whole game. Um, I struggled to walk up the stairs and so forth. So, yeah, it was, it was going to do more damage me playing than me not playing. So I had to make the decision to call it a day, really. Oh, my God. When you called it a day, uh, did you, in all this time, did you ever reach back out to Leighton Orient? And I'm going to keep saying this because mm -hmm. it's something that even though people are talking about it now, it seems like it's still happening. And did you reach out to them and say, this is what I'm going through? This is how did your mental well-being cope with all of this? Because you're saying your mum, you've got to understand your, you know, I'm sure people will understand your mum must have been going, you know, her well-being would have been, you know, put at risk as well. It's mm -hmm. just the two of you. Yeah. Um, I think, um, again, at the time, it's only now that I'm stepping into my purpose and I can fully understand what I went through mentally as well as physically that I'm able to to understand um how much of an impact it did have on me at the time I didn't it was just I'm um, injured like players get released I was just one of the unlucky ones but I think because of the age that I was I was like 16 7 no sorry 17 to 19 so I was in my my college years and I think there was so much pressure from college, a young woman, career, because at that time as well, football, as much as it has improved, the avenue for women was very limited in the sense of financially supporting. So I always had a contingency or thought to have a contingency. However, I had scholarship offers um, like America. I was going on certain trials and so forth which over in the states they pay much more and they support their women differently but again by this time my knees were in a different different state and weren't able to uh, endure what in a in an ideal situation situation yeah uh, if you don't mind do you mind sharing with us what the mental anguish was like in those dark days trying to understand why you because I'm sure that's the question you asked yourself why me how you know did you basically you know how did you see yourself where did you see yourself going if you don't mind sharing those days because I know they were dark days for you definitely so I think 
again, only now I can look back and speak of the past, but if I put myself back into the time, I'm more able to tell you so what I did do. So what happened to me is when I went to college, obviously my head was not in the right state. Um, I struggled to focus in lessons um, in which I ended up leaving college early. And um, my mindset solely fo became focused on money um, and supporting myself because other than football, I had no other passion or um, no other vision in what I really wanted to do. Football was solely my only passion, focus and so forth. So it wasn't just losing football, it was losing a part of myself, it was losing my identity. And then I think going through college at the same stages where I'm having to try and get through and overcome these things, I just channeled my energy into other means. And um, I think where I um, grew up, the area and so forth, because of my football, I wasn't exposed to a lot of things in which the youngsters back then today are exposed to in the sense of um, the ends or like socialising, going out, parties, all of these things. And the age in which I was introduced to it due to not being able to go and play football, um, it was much more... Um, it was much more common at that time. So I think where people had like a staggered introduction to socialization and and um, early adulthood, um, I just went from being a young footballer, teenager to now I'm an adult. And then the influences were very much, a lot of my friends and so forth came from different areas. So they'd grown up in, being out on the streets, like chasing money and so forth. And I think because I didn't have that balance, I was very easily influenced because my mind wasn't right at the time anyway. So I was very easily influenced into other avenues, which I then fell into. So I started to party a lot. Um, as I said, my focus was on money. So um, I used to, when my friends used to go and link guys, I used to see guys pull up in certain cars and wear certain clothes. And I used to think, my mom has been working her ass off, excuse my French, for so many years. And don't get me wrong, we never went without. My mom done an impeccable job in raising my brother and I. I'm bowing to but, mommy. <laughs> big up mommy. But yeah. um, in the same breath, it was, again, I was exposed to a means of life in which I didn't know. So the whole illegitimacy of life, the criminality side of life, I wasn't aware of it. And I feel like, um, cause I was quite naive, I was gullible, I was lost. I thought I was doing things to benefit or enhance my situation, not realizing the criminality or illegitimacy that came with certain things and certain people I was engaging with. So it, it, it took it took a bad turn for about three to four years, really. What was a turning point that you realised that you couldn't, you're not following your dream, which was football, you were mentally actually, de you know, depleting. What was a turning point for you? Um, well, my family are Christians, so I've always had the Lord by my side, um, which again, only Amen. now I've realized how sometimes you go through avenues, like you have to go through the dark to see the light. And only now today doing what I do, I'm able to say that a lot of things I went through, I had to go through them. I was meant to go through them because had I not, a lot of the stuff that I do today, I wouldn't be able to do because I grew up in a very, um, how can I put it, legitimate, um, um, well, uh, I'm trying to find the right words for it, but a loving family. Um, uh, I don't know if correct's the right term, but well-educated, like do everything right. 
so to yeah. speak. But then, yeah. yeah, in a sense, it was sort of a sheltered upbringing because I was so oblivious to the other side of life. Mm. And having dabbled in that world, I now got to see and understand which is which contributes to what I'm doing today in what certain kids go through in a sense of parents being drug addicts, in a sense of growing up on the ends, in the sense of not having the support. And I was able to use my good upbringing with my introduction to another life and find the balance to now be able to um, do what I do and speak on what I speak on. So you find in those introductions, because you say you, you didn't just fall into it, how did you get to become, because remember, you, you what people don't realise is you're also a referee, you're also an FA coach. So before we get all of that, did you acquire all of that at the when you had that turning point? When did you acquire all of that? So what happened for me, um, with the illegitimacy part, um, I was so close to trouble that, um it was an eye opener um obviously i could see what it was doing to my mum in some respects um and it just wasn't me i think as i said my mind wasn't in the right place and as you get older i guess you mature and i came to my senses to realize this is not my portion and in doing so i, I focused more on my word i was attending church more and um the Lord was speaking to me. And um, as I said, where I was chasing money, like I've worked, as much as I speak on illegitimate things I may have dabbled in, I worked for the council. Um, I was a commercial manager in construction and so forth. But again, it was the money that was advertised. You got that quiet. Hold to the minute. So you studied. Hold to the minute. Hold on a second, dear. <laughs> Listen, this is a special young lady with you in here. Listen, a commercial manager. Do you know what it is to be a commercial manager in construction? I'm from the construction world. Oh, is it? Okay. Right. Okay. Oh, come on now. My, my, my dad's in construction. My brother's in construction. I've worked in construction. All oh, right. But so I'm applauding you. Thank you. But this is what you I'm studied, saying. About you studied. You, you, how did you get to be a commercial manager? Because that's so, not easy. This is what I'm saying. The Lord works in mysterious ways because I made the conscious decision to step away from a lot of what I was in. I knew it wasn't my portion and I was praying, speaking on it, asking for guidance, grounding, lead me and so forth. And um, I've always like been independent um, in the sense of I've been working since I was 17. Obviously, I still live at home. My mom still supports me, but I mean, in the sense of I get my own and um, um, with regards to the jobs I got into, they came out of the blue. When I decided to make that change, things just started happening for me. I didn't, I didn't, so the commercial manager, I was a trainee commercial manager, but I was managing sites, I was supervising sites with no form of qualification whatsoever. It was, wow. it just, I, so how I came about that job, my initial industry I worked in was hospitality. Um, I went, I was working for the council at the time, but for an agency, which wasn't giving me enough funds. So I decided to step back into hospitality as a part-time job. Um, I got various offers. I'd have been in the industry for a very long time. Um, however, there was one job as much as it wasn't paying much, but it just, I thought, why not? Let's go. So I went to a trial shift in Canary Wolf, um, Jamie Oliver restaurant and, um, I was shadowing um, one of the waiters at the time and the table I served um, happened to be my future employers. So, oh, wow. Li this is, oh, God, is too good. But, oh, my word. So I stepped in, I served them. Um, I, like, I, have, I know the ins and outs, so I know how to like read the situation, do above and beyond from a waitress perspective um and then I managed to get the job that night um and I left to go home and I took a different route to what I'd usually take 
Um, and in Canary Wharf, I don't know if you're familiar, but in the summer they do a lot of like stalls, bar stalls, food yes. stalls and so forth. Yes. So the grass area in which I walked through, I came across three of the members that were on the table that I'd previously served. So as I went past to be courteous and polite, I was like, hi, you're right. And they like recognised me. They're like, oh, you're the girl from the restaurant, blah, blah, blah. So we got talking, got talking. And then they were like, there's something about you. And these, these are Mancunians, never met them in my life. Um, and they were like, there's something about you. Like, you fit in really well with what we do. Have you ever worked with lifts? And I'm like, lifts? What do you mean lifts? I'll just get in the lift. I don't know nothing about lifts. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then they started to explain that they are the, they are the installation team for Mitsubishi um, oh, in lift wow. engineering. Yeah, so literally from that night of getting a job at Jamie Oliver, as much as I was successful, I also got offered a job by these people that I just met like in the restaurant on my child shift. And within two months, they sent they they created the position for me. The position didn't even exist. They they we had a conversation, they connected with me and they were like, We want to offer you a job. And within two months, they'd drawn drawn me up a contract. They'd been in contact with me and I was now a trainee commercial manager in construction. Never stepped into the field before, no qualifications, oh nothing. Oh my God. Yeah. That is nuts. <laughs> Excuse my French again. No that worries. is crazy. So mm. you're now a trainee commercial manager. Um, you, you know, you're out on site. I know what Mitsubishi is like because you've got Connie, Mitsubishi, you've got Otis, yeah. you've got yeah. all of these little Schindlers. Yeah, yeah, Schindler, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all coming out now, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so, you know, but when did you acquire your referee badge? You know, when? <sighs> Listen, no, no one would believe I'm 26, the amount of stories I've got to tell for it. But, um... well, this is all about you. We've got time. <laughs> oh, bless you. So... Um, I was in construction for 18 months, and as I'd said, I had no form of qualification. Um, I was on a trainee course, so when I um, was offered a job, in my pre-contract they stated £6,000 were going to training and so forth um, within the first year. Within the first year, I didn't receive anything apart from the application for my CSCS, which I needed to get on site anyway, and then... They also put me forward for the triple STS, um, triple STS as well, um, but no other um, construction related qualifications. So um, because in the first probably month, couple of weeks, I recuperated nearly 30 grand for the company in contra charges and extra works, despite not having done anything like that before and so forth. So um they decided that they wanted to make me a supervisor for a site. But the thing is, they probably perceived me, and I don't like to throw the discrimination card, but they probably thought, oh, yeah, she's a little black girl, rough around the edges, like she can handle herself, but she don't know nothing. But little did they know, I come from an educated family. So they were trying to ginnels me. Excuse my language. For those that don't know ginnels, they were trying to take the mick out of me. And... Um, yeah, so they put me on a site um, for a six-month period on a site um, as the supervisor, but I was having to sign off works, Lola's, um, Hoist, um, all these things that I'd never engaged with myself. I was doing client liaison, making sure they were on time with the, the program, um, reporting extra works, all these different things which I just took in my stride. However, there was one incident whereby where we installed a lift, so it's a shaft, can be anything up to 50, 60, whatever floors. One of my um, engineers stepped out of the lift and a big chunk of concrete dropped up from the 10th floor and literally licked it, missed his head by about that much. Now, I was going to say, please tell me that he it missed him, right? Yeah, it just missed him, thank God. But if it had gone the other way, I was on paper, despite no qualifications, the most senior member of staff. All responsibility fell on me. And for those that don't know, in construction, if you're found responsible 
for anything. You can face up to two years imprisonment. That's correct. NHBC and so forth. NHBC would have been on you. On me differently. So when that happened now, it sort of like woke me up again. And I started to research into like the criteria of the role I was doing, um, all the ins and outs um, and so forth. And um, I actually raised concern with my employers stating that as much as I'm eager to learn and I'm happy that they've entrusted me in such a position, um, it's beyond my remit. And I'm going to require some form of training to be able to do my job to the best of my ability. Well done. Um, as you probably know, being in construction yourself, the construction industry is a very corrupt industry and oh. very money and orientated industry. Oh my God. So I went backwards and forwards with my employer for two months of emails stating that I need some form of training. I'm a trainee commercial manager. Train me in commercial management. I don't, as much as I need to know the lift industry, I am not a supervisor. I'm a trainee commercial manager. So that is more of a... Um, so you were used, basically. Sorry? You were used. Exactly. You I was used. used as a guinea pig, a scapegoat, and so forth. And the more I, I started to speak to um, like project managers and so forth, not, not exposing what was going on, but indirectly showing them what was going on, and in doing so, um, every email I sent to these people, they just diverted around what I was saying. Everything was disregarded. And then it came across, like, they put it back to me, like, oh, Lexi, like, you're asking for too much, blah, blah, blah. You don't need this. You'll learn this and so forth. But it was black and white. When it comes to health and safety, there's no there's no questions. You have Absolutely. to do things in a particular Absolutely. order. Absolutely. And they weren't listening. So off of the back of it, a couple of weeks later, um, they turned around and said to me, oh, unfortunately, the site is coming to an end. We have no other sites available for you. Therefore, we'll have to dismiss you by the end of the end of the month. That's it. Gone. They knew what they were doing. Of course they knew what they were doing. They knew what they, they were doing. But knew what they, were doing. Yeah, they knew what they were doing. Um, yeah. they, there was a means to a purpose to save money. It yeah. didn't take any form of health and safety into consideration. Mm -hmm. It was, we're going to float by this. This is what we need to do. Unfortunately, it's luckily for you that the client who mm. they were working for wasn't aware of the legalities of the, or the illegalities that were going mm -hmm. on. Um, yeah. And that's why they were to get away with it. 100%. They made 200% profit on me in six months. That's what's so happened. Yeah, and even down to like the engineers, I won't go too much into it, but everything they was they were double charging what they were paying people. So yeah, so off the back of that, leading to the answer to your question, apologies. So okay. um, yeah, I was um, I, I was sacked from my job. Um, I was in a bad place again, and again I reached out to the Lord, and then. Um, I was in other sort of construction jobs, but the same sort of thing kept arising. And then um, within a week of leaving my job, um, my level one, FA level one course was available. I got selected for, um, it's called 100 FC, where they give 100 women throughout the year an opportunity to obtain their coaching badges free of charge. Oh, wow. So that happened within a week of leaving my job. Then the referee thing came up as well. And then, yeah, like, locked out. Um, so this was, yeah, so what I'm talking about now was the beginning of 2020 when I left my job. So Mitsubishi was 2018, but I had other construction jobs. And then I left that one because, again, they were trying to take the mick out of me. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, within a week, my, my coaching come up, my referee came up, my refereeing came up. And then lockdown kicked in. And then, yeah, lockdown was very difficult. The first one, especially, um, my mum can definitely vouch for that. I was bouncing off the walls in the sense of just losing it. I'm a very active 
social person and network my life my progression in life has solely happened through god and networking um and then this led into where we are getting to now um, yeah so yeah i don't know if you want to ask me a question or if you i want do to i do or, so right. we've come into lockdown and you just said it, you're bouncing around and you're bouncing around. And I don't know how you managed to meet Michael because you're now working as a youth advocate. Yes. Where, how did you bounce into that? Because, you know, the Lord hasn't put you anywhere that you know that you can't handle. You know that, right? Definitely. How did you bounce into that? We're now in 2020. You've now qualified, you've got your FA badge, but you can't do anything because football shut down. You're mm -hmm. now a football, you're, you're an FA coach. You can't do anything, football shut down. Mm -hmm. Take me to the next, uh, next part of this journey, working with the children. Okay, so, um, so through lockdown, again, prayer and so forth, um, I was recommended to, so I went to a football training session. Um, I went, so I tried to get back into football, just like playing for fun and so forth. And on my, this is how it is, on my coaching course, I met some Spanish ladies that train up in Stockwell. So I attended two sessions and I met their coach. Um, didn't really have too much to say to him, just like, just normal conversation, maybe gave him a little bit of what I do or trying to do, but nothing too in depth. And then, um, about a month or two down the line, um, I received a call from a lady that runs an organisation called Goals for Girls. Um, and basically, she I had been recommended for a position that they had going as a sessional football coach. Um, alongside that, I attended um, something called Wholeness Academy, and um, which is run by um, a lady called Jacqueline Peer, Apostle Jacqueline Peer. And um, a lady I met on the course, she was a mentor for a company called Precious Moments and Health Limited, okay. of which she also recommended me for the role and I got the role. So that's two roles that I got through different avenues trying to find myself again. Um, and then how I met Michael, I attended the 2020 protests um, where I came into contact with um, yeah, came into contact with two police officers um, and I was speaking, I don't really talk to the police, not in any such a way, but it's just not really yeah. my thing. But yeah. two police officers, I have to commend them because they were so down to earth and they even gave me a different perspective in a sense of people in a uniform, behind the uniform there's people. And That's I think, correct. That's absolutely correct. And I think through, obviously, my earlier stages in life, being around certain people, there was so, such a negative stigma given towards the police. So as much as I hadn't had any encounters myself, I'd sort of picked up on the same stigmas. Um, however, I spoke to these police officers out of the blue, and one of them happened to play football. And we got talking about football, and then she invited me to some football thing and then she was like, oh, I know a guy called Michael, duh, 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 duh. put me in contact with Michael. And then me and Michael were on the phone and it just blossomed from there. Like every- <laughs> It's fantastic. It's so, I'm, I can't even, I'm trying to put in words my journey, but it's supernatural. I can only say- You're articulating it beautifully. Please continue. Oh, it's thank beautiful. you. Thank you, but- no word of a lie, I can only give all the glory to God and uh, apologies for anyone that's not religious or spiritual that's tuning in, but I'm standing in my truth right now and I have to give all praise to the Most High because what has happened to me in my I've journey... i my eyes, sorry. <laughs> what has happened to me in my journey, um, it can't be written. It couldn't have been written and I think... As I said, now I sit where I sit. Now I stand where I stand. Now I understand where I'm at. Everything I've been through, the good, the bad, the ugly, the legit, the illegit, 
In all of it, my heart has been pure. In all of it, I've only had good intentions. And I used to beat myself up because especially coming from the generation that I'm in, a lot of people, um, they, they, we were easily led into things that are not of us. Like all of, a lot of the things I got into was not my portion, but only now it makes sense. As I said, you have to go through the dark to see the light. And if I right. didn't do, get involved, witness half of the things I did, I would not to be able to stand here today and educate the children that are going through twice as much right now and speak it with passion and understanding because I've been through it. I've lived it. I've seen it in the flesh live. And, yeah, so now I work for about three, four different companies. Um, I mentor individual students, um, autist, autistic kids. I work with kids with so mental health. All this, Sorry. It's like, you, again, is it, it's people recognize the beauty of you and you've now, you're, you're now working as, you know, with children, you know, yeah. Is, did you ever envisage yourself doing that? And I want you to come back to that. I just want people to understand yeah. that, you know, you've done all these different things and here you are working now with children to turn their lives around. Yeah, I think only now, again, because I know what I've been through and I know what avenues I had to go through to get to where I am now, it's like I didn't have a vision for children, like, but God had a vision for me with children. I used to walk in the flesh. I used to walk chasing money, as I said. I wanted, um, yeah, things of the flesh, things of man. But when God has a plan and a purpose, and I'm sorry to ramble on about God, but that's... Do not the... apologise for what you feel and how your faith is. Never. Thank you. Thank you. But literally, it's been shaped. It was already written. And as I said, everything I went through was to get me to where I am today. And with my, my understanding now, my maturity and so forth, I can weigh everything up, I can balance everything up. And I'm still of an age where kids look at me and can see themselves. I can I can differentiate the way I speak, whether it be corporate, whether it be to the youth then, whether it be on the roads, whether it be in front of the queen, like I can, I can switch it up. And that is all part of my journey. My journey is has got me to where I am now. And but I'm just I'm just ready for what God's got in store for me because I've only and just started. Yeah, there's I've, more. I've what is it that, what are you instilling? Because you're telling your story, and this is why, again, it for me, I, I I'm just so proud to have you on this show. I swear. Thank your you. purpose, you have been through a lot, and you you the beauty of it is that you didn't feel that you needed to go degrading what the things that you've seen. Mm -hmm. But what you are is imparting knowledge to, you know, children who are have probably a mental, you know, ability, disabilities or just needing love in their life. You are bringing that to them in the, the work that you're doing right now. Kick off at three, which a lot of people don't really know about. Because you're an ambassador, mm -hmm. you've now become an ambassador for them too. Yeah. All of that is incorporated. What is the thing, what are the things that you are instilling is my next question. So me, I am instilling being, hence the reason on the show as well, the, the title couldn't be any better. But standing in your truth, I feel like in this life, we're put in boxes, whether it be your race, your gender, your ethnicity, your social status. And me, I'm an anomaly. I do not fit into any box. I've always had people tell me I should be there, I should be here, I should be doing that, I should be doing that. But all I've done is stay true to myself and keep it real with Lord. Even when I speak to God, when I pray, I talk to God, I'm like, yo, God, big man, please. Like, sometimes I have to talk to him, like, yo, big man, please. I love it. Yo, big man. <laughs> Like, come on. <laughs> like, on, this, on a serious note, I'm just a, I'm just here 
to I feel like a lot of the youth today are going through an identity crisis and when I lost football I felt I was only now I understand that I was probably going through the same thing but I had to lose myself to find myself and now I found myself I want to help other people find themselves without or giving them the support or mechanisms to not have to go through half of the things I went through in order to do so. And with saying all of that, it's not like you, you've apologised so many times for the beauty of your faith. Um, everyone has faith, even if it's just faith in the universe, mm -hmm. Islam, even if they're atheists, people think yeah. that, you know, being an atheist is... It's something you believe in. You've got to believe in something, whether it be yourself. Yeah. And so, you know, I, what I'm saying to you is this. I'm sure when you are showing everybody uh, or teaching, you are not forcing your faith on these children. You're, you're teaching them life. Am I correct? Yeah. Most definitely. I think when it comes to professionalism, Obviously, there's fine lines within the sectors I'm in, especially like education and so forth. So I don't tend to really speak on my my faith or beliefs unless a student brings that same dynamic to me. However, as you said, everyone has faith in something and the faith has to start with yourself. And I feel like a lot of the kids that I work with, they don't even have that faith within themselves. They don't have the confidence I work with kids from the, as young as 12 that talk about suicide like you haven't even started your life yet how can you feel suicidal but then it's not how can you because until you walk in someone's shoes you don't know and everyone tends to look at the exterior but people fail to understand it depends where you come from do these young kids have parents do these young kids eat every day do these young kids have money to go to school? Are these young kids getting bullied in school and so forth? So once you can teach someone or help someone understand themselves, and I think that's what happened with me. I had to understand myself. I had to find myself and own, own my wrongs, own my rights, love myself despite what has gone on, whether it worked or not, and have that faith to be able to now walk in my purpose. Man, for you're tw you're twenty six years old, right? I am, yes. <sighs> Lexi, I don't know many male or females that could actually put their hand in the heart and speak as eloquent, deeply, and know themselves as you have done today. Thank you. It resonated. It has resonated so deeply. Um, and your honesty is just boundless. I just have to say that. And I'm hoping that whoever watches this um, on, you know, YouTube, because you've had some beautiful comments here in the, the chat room. You probably can't see them. Um, I can see you, them. A lot of them is my family. Also. A lot of them is my family. I'm not going to lie. Right. Big up my family or the chat. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I am speechless, and that's something that never happens. Wow. It's the, the, the beauty of everything that you've said, the children that you're teaching, because please, without having to break any confidentiality, what sort of children are you teaching? So I just want people to get a rounded idea of the challenges that you are dealing with when you are trying to instill some form of normality. Most definitely. Okay, so um, I work with um, children that are from deprived areas as one. Um, I work with children with mental health. I work with children with, that are autistic. I work with children that are victims or witnesses of domestic violence. I work with children that have self-harmed, um, special educational and mental health needs, um, and just misunderstood and... Um, I think one thing as well, a lot of these children, some do receive support, some others don't, but there's a lot of the support comes from such a rigid structure, such a textbook way of teaching. But I come from the real, I come from the emotion, I come from the passion, like I do it because I've done it. 
I do it because I love it. I do it because I feel it. And it's not for the money. Like, I'll tell you right now, even if I didn't get paid, I'll still do what I do because we as beings have purpose to provide for our next beings. And I don't have children yet, but the younger generation I perceive as my children in a sense. Like, I have a responsibility as a adult that's come up through a lot of the stick to share and prevent a lot of these youngsters from going through. And I think the thing that resonates with me the most is the young women. I feel like the young ladies of today, especially, do we have role models out there? If we do have role models, do we see them? Especially young, um, again, not to take it to certain categories, but young black women, what young black role models do we have out there? Like, I've got girls in my classes tell me they don't like their skin. They don't like their hair. Like, these are things. We're living in London, such a multicultural society, but we're still facing racism in 2021. It makes no sense. But what I see is a narrative. They're pushing a narrative to divide us as a people. They're pushing a narrative to confuse the youngsters. They speak more about... And please, I haven't got anything against it, but they speak oh, say more it. about LGBT and all these things, things that kids are not even aware of, in a sense, before they speak of loving yourself. Everyone is equal. Black, white, Asian, yellow, purple, green. Like, we are humans before all of these demographics. And I just want to teach people, you only have one life. You only on you. You are different to the next man, to the next woman, and so forth. And I have been able to elevate and proceed in being different, and I love it. No one can tell me nothing, like not on a, a policy or anything like that. But respectfully, no one can tell me nothing because no one's walked in my shoes. No one knows me. But having heard my journey today, and that's probably even a fragment of what I've of everything I've been through. So, yeah. It really is a fragment. It is a fragment. It's it's like there's little bits of here and little bits of there. And I really don't care that, you know, whatever time we started, I just, it's, take me to where, how you, someone has just said you're a really great role model for the children you work with. God bless you. Thank you, MD Media. Thank you. I wanted to also bring this up. We're going to go back just a little bit. So you work with the children but you still have a personal journey of heartache for yourself or heartache yeah. for yourself, which is you still are rehabilitated in terms of your own body. It's yeah. taken you a while. In your own pain, mm -hmm. you are here helping other people. Mm -hmm. You said something to me the other day, and, I, and I'm hoping if you don't mind, you don't have to share it. No, go ahead, but, go ahead. You know, you said something the other day that, you know, in all the time you're trying to find some, and we're going to come back also to the grassroots of football and all that. Okay. That all the time that you have been out there looking for the help, you know, you got the support from your mother, but you finally, finally found someone that realized the pain you were still going through for the injuries that you've had. Could you just elaborate a little bit more about that? If you don't mind sharing that. Oh, most definitely. This man is deserves all the all the glory and what I'm about to share. So um, going back to the supernatural encounters and connections that were made, firstly through Michael, um, I featured on a webinar or a Zoom call to um, young police cadets and youngsters and so forth, again, just sharing my story. And there was a man on there called Errol um, Company, um, Jellop Promotions, go check them out, based in Tottenham. He's a um, youth worker um, and deals with the youth community within Tottenham. And sharing my story um, and just how I was left to my own devices and so forth and still 10 years down the line, not fully rehabilitated the initial injury that I underwent. Um, he felt my story and on the call, he said, Michael, um, I got a question, and he said, "You know what? Let's see. There's something about you. I felt everything you said, and I want to offer you your healing." Errol has 
out of his own pocket, paid for my rehab. 10 years down the line, I can finally say every Saturday for the last, well, the last two weeks, and I think it will go on to who knows when, but I go to, um, I go to Hackney and I'm seen by a senior physiotherapist that is helping me on the road to recovery. So Errol, honestly, my heart, you hold such a special space and just thank you as well as Michael, of course, that initiated the um, initiated the connection between us. So again, God is good. And he's a man of oh God as well. I must say he's a man God. of God. And, and Valerie, even the conversation we had and every conversation I have, it's not normal. It's not like me and you, we never met. The first conversation, how long was we on the phone for? We were on the phone for a good quick five minutes. <laughs> <Long time. laughs> Woo! Nice. Oh, my God. Time yeah, definitely. God Imagine. Is good. God is good. It, the pain. People don't, you know, if you don't believe in something, it's easy to drop off. It's easy to go back to something that you're not, you know, because it feels good, it, you know, that comfort zone. Yes. You know, when you step out of that comfort zone and you're not, you're not praying to the universe, you're not praying to no God, you just have to have that self. Someone said, as Natasha just said, that self-healing, you were here, you were put there, mm -hmm. you know, that self-healing in itself to serve is to heal. Amen. But even though there's days, I'm sure, that you get dark days where you think that, my God, the devil is trying to be stronger than God. Or even if you're not even thinking of God as a purpose, it's mm -hmm. like, I'm about to give in. Yeah. But the beauty is, I don't know Errol, but you were meant to meet Errol. And I think that Michael has become this catalyst. Definitely and I said sure. this to Michael today. I had a conversation with him. And, you know, I don't know if he's watching. He's probably at work right now. And, and my, those who don't know, I've had Michael Wallace, who is um, a police officer. He's come on the show and he's just the most enigmatic man that can talk you out of anything. He could talk you into anything because that's just how good he is. Mm. Um, he's a great mediator. And this man literally just introduces people, but he, he goes by energy and the feel good. He doesn't just put people together because he thinks that you should. Mm. the people that he has around is good people indeed and he wants to see the youths to stop fighting so we're gonna we're not gonna try and bring that because we, we're here to change the narrative yeah you know, no matter what's happening out there the youths that are killing or we want to it's about a positive narrative that there's people like yourself out there that's trying to make change, who are trying to change the narrative, to let them know that you just don't give up on yourself. Indeed, yeah. One more thing I'm going to ask you is this. What would you change within women and men's football? Because you spoke about youngsters who, and earlier on there were some messages saying there's not enough support. Yeah. Because there are a lot of ex Footballers, male and female, who, yeah. like yourself, were ceremoniously dumped with nowhere to go, no one to turn to. What would you, what is that message or you think should be put into place? Okay, so again, so everything that's happened has led on, led on, led on. So touching on my refereeing, um, I'll tell you my referee badge and um, I, I, um, volunteered to li play linesman for a game. It was a men's game, a cup game, first game I'd ever refereed, but it was local to my house, quick 30 pounds for an hour and a half. I was like, yeah, of course, I'll do that. So I went down there and it was a YouTube team. And funnily enough, one of the teams, I knew a lot of people that played for them. Um, anyway, fast forward, long story short, one of the guys that was videoing the game, he then got speaking to me and was like, oh, how'd you get into refereeing X, Y, Z? And then he invited me to his podcast. So Big Up Alpha Barry, that's the first platform I was on, um, One Take Media. Um, I did a podcast and we spoke on the death of a young man called Jeremy Winston, who was a Man City um, 
academy player and was released and he sadly took That's his right. own life off yes. of the back of it. Awful, so awful, that, awful. Most definitely. So that was the first podcast platform I had, which led on to a lot of other things. But again, in answer to your question, there's a lot of stuff that I'm working on. There's people working on. But um, with regards to support, I just feel like the clubs need to take responsibility. At the end of the day, if these young academy players make first team and are scoring a lot of goals or playing their position or um, performing very well within the team, you're going to take all credit for it. You're going to take the credit that comes with it. Oh, we did, we did that. I believe it's the responsibility of the club, not necessarily to hold on to the player, but between all the clubs out there, there needs to be a support system, whether it's a grassroots support system, whether it's a professional academy or whatever, there needs to be a support system in place because it's just becoming too apparent. It's happening too often. We shouldn't have 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds killing themselves because they're released from a football academy. As well as that, I feel like they need to enhance the educational side um, in the sense of, okay, how many players make it from academies to professional first team players? Not many. That is obvious. A lot of people know it. So why not put in place other avenues for the kids to go on, whether it's a physiotherapist, find out what the key, the children enjoy, find out what other elements of the game. Another thing, once I went through everything I went through is only probably when I got into my 20s that I began to realise that there's other sectors within the footballing world there's commentating there's refereeing there's coaching there's there's physiotherapy there's so much that they can teach or offer and if the club can't do it themselves they're sponsored by how many they're um, how many people they've got partnerships with how many different people open extend those arms extend those arms i feel from you can represent a club no matter what stage you've played part you are part of that club you have played a role within that club so it's of their duty to now have a role in your life if it doesn't go the way in which you expected it to pan out so I yeah, hope they see this and wanted. I was highlighting this I hope they sorry to cut you I didn't mean to cut you there I hope mm -hmm. they see this and I will be making sure this section is definitely highlighted and over every social media that I have mm -hmm. and 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 kept you know literally just keep because you know you and I we both love football you know we're football enthusiasts I you know no, well not just football I like boxing too <laughs> I like my boxing yeah <laughs> <laughs> You know, if I think if it was left, if there was nobody else that we couldn't see the chat room, it would be just me and me and Lexi and I having a good old chat. <laughs> but I said to her before we started, I'm going to behave myself and um, <laughs> be professional. <laughs> but I'm coming to the end and I'm hoping I have captured you in the spirit of when we first spoke. I hope that through this interview you felt that you have shared your story and you've said all the things that you want to say that you feel that this um again when anyone watches this back uh, will touch their lives it will touch their lives for their children it will touch their lives as a human being as a person to want a direction if they're feeling low and they don't know where to go listen to Lexi because it you know it it doesn't matter if you didn't have an injury you know you could have lost your house you could have but it's staying focused it's never giving up on yourself that's the message i have taken away for myself from you which as i said it just it just brought a tear to my eye because in the in the lockdown that we are in right now everyone is finding it tough yeah everyone no one is exempt and I'm sure you're you, you're finding that with the parents for the children that you teach, for the children yeah. that are coming to you who are finding it very hard themselves. We are now dealing with all of a sudden the word safeguarding, country line is the more biggest word that is coming out of lockdown. 
yeah. you know, well-being has now become a thing of the past. It's now Indeed. safeguarding. My yeah. God, you know, safeguarding uh, the, the future. You've not, as you said, you've got no children yet, you know, yeah. and here we are people who have been molested and or another thing I think I don't I'm sure I was saying to somebody else and I, you know if this is the final part in words which was and I'm terrible you know because I tend to have a lot of things going on and I digress um was okay. we a lot of our trauma and I'm sure you you would agree comes from things that's happened from our past growing up Definitely. I would never seem to address them then. It takes something to happen to trigger. And even if that incident, whether it was someone slap you, you hurt your foot, it triggers that trauma. Indeed. And you find that trauma you're suffering from and not the actual injury. Does that make sense? Not 100%, 100%. Um, and that's with children too, don't you think? Yeah, it, it, I see it every day. I see it every day, um, whether it be a bereavement, whether it be um, just home or whatever. A lot of people don't express themselves and they hold on to things, which, as you said, is a, is a trauma in itself, hold it, not letting go of the past. And um, I had to... Um, I had to own my past, but at the same time, let go and realize the past will never change. But as long as I have a present, I can change the future. I'm bowing. Lexi, it has been a pleasure to have you on here today. Um, I'm sending a lot of love to your mum. I don't know her, but thank you, Mama for having such a wonderful daughter oh, and you. I'm hoping that when we're out of lockdown I will see you at the kickoff at three I think they're having something in June so yeah. I'm looking forward to catching up with you in person to give you the biggest elbow hugs um, <laughs> as best as possible um, I hope that we can have you on again later on in the year to see where you are in terms of the therapy that you're having. Hey mom, I know you're there. And mom, come say hi. Come say hi. Yeah. Come on then, please, mom. I'm sure you look great. <laughs> hi. <laughs> are you beautiful? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> um, Valerie, just before I go, can I quickly share a poem that I wrote in 2020? I would love you to. Please do. Okay, so... Um, hold on, I've got it up here. All right, so the poem um, was... I did a presentation because the same job I spoke about, which I was recommended for in what I'm doing now, one of the schools rejected me because of my DBS... Um, I got, whereas I spoke about some of the trouble I got into, as much as I was made, uh, I was a guinea pig, I um, took the repercussions of what took place. So um, in order to justify myself in a sense, I wrote this poem in 2020, um, and I think it resonated with a lot of people, but um, it's called Who Am I? And it goes, who am I or who are we in this life? Are we allowed to be a conditioned world that claims we're free? But what is free if I cannot be me? Young, naive and no support, I once was led astray. I faced the judge, paid the price, they'll still get judged today. The offences that were listed paint a poor and vivid story. Although it's not the full truth, I am well and truly sorry. Far from perfect, I have made a few mistakes, tried to right my wrongs, but still can't catch a break. I have learned a lot of lessons, enhanced in wisdom too, but if a DBS defines me, what more can I do? I am a true representation of what, um, oh, so G4G is my com the company I work for. So I'm a true representation of what G4G express. The only difference being I've come up through the mess. From social barriers to glass ceilings, I've experienced it all. 
despite numerous injustice face, I remain standing tall. So allow me to be an example, a message to the youth, a narrative for a generation searching for the truth. The past cannot be changed, however the future can. I'm a role model, an advocate, a lion, not a lamb. <sighs> wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Lexi, can I ask, has that been published? It hasn't. It hasn't. You really need to publish that poem. And I, so. I know I said earlier that I was going to have a different, that section earlier. This section where you have just read that poem will be the highlight that will be sitting on the YouTube page going forward. Lexi, you need to get it published. And Natasha, I know you're going to kill me for doing this. I always <laughs> need to do this when someone comes in that blows me away. But there is a couple of publishers that we are privy to. And Natasha, I know you're in the chat room somewhere. If you can, uh, my phone has died, but I'm going to text you when the show is over. And even if she's left, I'm going to text her. Natasha Vigil runs um, Black Wall Street London 2020 as a platform mm. for artists, um, uh, creative people with books, shoes, you name it, um, for uh, an Afrocentric entrepreneurs. And on this platform, there are a few publishers. I'm also in touch with another publisher. And if you don't mind, I would like to share that to them it's mm -hmm. not a promise of of whatever might come out of it but i would like that poem and i'm only going to keep that poem up for about a week or two because the best thing is for people to actually see, hear it and then it comes down and for you to then have it published if there's anything that i think that i think that should come out of today is that ah she's here right here already reached out to Lexi via Michael? Oh, yeah, we did me. I forgot to say hi, Natasha. Right, to say too. <laughs> tell me that you're going on to Natasha's um, um, uh, platform. On she's got the wonderful 24 hour platform. She's just messaged me on here. Sorry, Tash, my phone has died. Thank you to everyone in the chat room. We are going to make this happen because I'm sure there's more poetry that you can write and this needs to be heard. And if there's anything that I think I would do in my life today is to make this happen, this has to happen. Natasha just says she's on it. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm hoping, not yet, but I hope we can connect at some time. So Natasha is, I, I, I don't need to speak for Natasha. <laughs> um, I don't need to, but she's been in here and she's been lit up by you today. Um, she's a fabulous woman who's just got the most amazing platform and she's one woman that can connect to you. So she's going to do a connection and I'm going to do a connection and let's just hope that somewhere we can get that poetry published. The poem that um, Lexi has just read out will only be up, that section will only be up for a week. Okay. Because we want it published. Amen. Thank okay. you so much. It's Thank no you. point having it up there because no one's going to buy it. So let's get it published. And if you want, I will do that highlight just for you so you can attach it to your publishing of when you first read it. And Amen. thank you, thank you for sharing. I'm honoured, I'm not going to lie, I am honoured to have you on Standing In My Truth. Thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Like I felt so comfortable and just thank you to everyone that tuned in. My family, love always, you already know. Um, and yeah, just a quick shout out. Michael, of course, kick off at free. Um, follow Michael. He's part founder of everything I'm being able to do. Um, Errol again, Jell Up Promotions. Um, yeah, and guys, big up Valerie though, like standing in my chief. I'm not the first and I'm sure I won't be the last, but I already said to Valerie, she's got a truth that we need to hear the standing in the truth of the standing in the truth. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, no, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. I'm just here to just let people 
speak and that, that standing in my truth is just it's all about just bringing voices to the table it's not glorified it's not oh let's get likes it's for other people as I said right at the beginning of the show to share wonderful people doing wonderful things out there that we never get the chance to hear and as I said if one person can shine a light to make someone else's life better then my job is done and I, and for me, I've walked away today learning something that I'm a grown, grown bottom woman. I won't say grown ass woman, but I'm a grown <laughs> woman who has been humbleified today. And I thank you for that. Um, to everyone in the chat room, family, and, and there's other people in there, to Siobhan. As I said, my phone died. I had messages on there. That's like, I can't even talk about them. Because it's th three different platforms. So you've got YouTube, which is where everybody is here. Then I've got Facebook, and then I've got fa another Facebook, and you're on Mixcloud. So I'm getting all different messages that you can only see. To everybody from, I think it's Lamar and D-Dubs and um, there was a few more in there and Natasha and Tony and, and, and everybody, all of you wonderful people. And to everyone that tunes in and after and catching this show, thank you for watching. Big up to, um, to Natasha, who's going to do everything that I'm, I'm hoping you're going to do that, Tash, that I'm asking to do. Lexi absolute pleasure and i'm gonna keep you in the green room while i say good night to everybody if you could just hang tight lovely no to have you Please say bye to everybody while you're here again guys thank you so much for tuning in i hope i can um, my story resonates with some of you and yeah let's let's spread the love together and have a great evening god bless this is my hands for all the deaf people yeah this is you know, happy hands. Call it happy hands. <laughs> God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Sit tight. <sighs> oh my God. Oh, I hate when I have a show and I and I I I get I I get really I get really teared up because, and I'm a soppy old cow, but I don't care. It was well worth being soppy about. Lexi was truly and wonderfully amazing. Um, Natasha just says, I've taken notes and have been educated in the righteous way. That is the message that we've taken today. Everybody, to everyone, as I said, in the chat room, to the messages that I've received, all of that love goes to Lexi, and I'm sure she can still hear the show. All of that love goes to you. Thank you for sharing your love with us. I know that on the Thursday night, I can sleep well, and I'll t I've made notes that apply as well as Natasha to ourselves. Tune in again tomorrow, completely different show, um, but I'm not even going to bother about what the show is tomorrow. Let's end it on this wonderful note. Love yourself. Positivity always conquers all and have faith. If it's not in the Lord, have faith in the universe, but believe in something. Do not hate anyone who has faith. Do not be upset that they have a faith in God. They're getting by is my message. Everyone is getting by with some form of faith. And with that, thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a positive evening, a positive weekend that's coming up. Stay strong and stand in your truth. Good night. God bless. <laughs>